I'd like to say that I'd be doing something imaginative like sitting on a beach or climbing a mountain, but I've always been a complete policy nerd, so if I wasn't here at the school uh, or I wasn't a journalist, I'd probably be working in a think tank or something like that. So the bodyguards is a term people use to describe the Indian super wealthy, which is the subject of my book, The Billionaire Raj. So bodyguards is an echo of the Russian oligarchs. And it comes from a time, maybe 10 years ago, when people were very worried about the rise of corporate power in India, and particularly the tycoons at the top of the corporate system. And so that's a topic that I talk about a lot in the book. Is it a bit too early to call it a billionaire raj? Well, maybe. I mean, I had to come up with a book title, and my book is about the rise of the Indian super wealthy, the rise of the billionaires. And the argument in the book is that these people, a very small number, maybe 120 of them who are now billionaires in India, have incredible amounts of power. And they've accumulated wealth more quickly, almost, than in any country in history. And so we'll see whether the billionaire raj is a short-run phenomenon or a long-run phenomenon. But at the moment, I think it's a very important debate in Indian public life. The argument that I try to make in The Billionaire Raj is that both of them have a little bit to these arguments, but actually you should care about the gap between the top and the bottom. Inequality in India has increased very rapidly over the last 10 or 15 years, and if it keeps going at the same rate, it will put India in the same bucket as some countries in South America or South Africa, and that isn't a place where you want to be. So the book has been pretty well reviewed and that's been very nice. I mean, to be honest, any compliment when it says it's well written are the ones that I enjoy most. Uh, perhaps the, the criticism uh, in the New York Times review, uh, they said that I claimed the book was optimistic, uh, but that actually if you read the book, there isn't very much to be optimistic about because the book is about a lot of challenges that India faces. But in the end, I thought that was, that was fair criticism. I mean, I think it's possible to grapple with the challenges that a developing economy faces and yet think that in the long run, its future can be fairly bright. Well, I think for Mr. Modi, uh, it is that the values that are enshrined in the Indian constitution of liberty and respect for minorities are the best path to economic growth in the future. For Mr. Gandhi, uh, it's a harder one. I mean, he, he's a politician who's struggling, and I think uh, so far we've seen that when he's attacked Mr. Modi on the subjects I describe in the book on problems of crony capitalism and corruption, he's done better. He's done better over the last six months before the election than he has before, and so I think he should keep going with that. My instinct is that Mr. Modi will return for a second uh, term as India's Prime Minister. Now, whether he will do so with a minority government or a majority, I think that's much harder to tell. I lived in Mumbai for five years, so there's only one answer you can give, and that is Sachin Tendulkar, the greatest batsman ever to walk the earth. And my heart says England, my head says India. Ah, uh, well, uh, I, I suppose I love Vadapav. Uh, my absolute favorite was Chole Batora, which I used to have in Mumbai. I'm a vegetarian, so the English breakfast is much good for me anymore. <laughs>